Can I still talk to you? Oh, I can hear an echo. I can hear myself talking back to me. Is that normal? Uh, how do I mute the video? Hmm. I have it open. Maybe, hold on. Can you still hear me? Okay. That's probably my bad. I didn't realize it was playing. I'm good to go. Let's kick it off. Yeah, I can hear you. Sounds good to me. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. I have our famed guest, Tom Lowry, designer advocate with Figma, who's also like me, but better. And I want him to reintroduce himself. He's back for the plugin showcase part two. Uh, and it's probably a two, it may be a 10 part series. Tom, introduce yourself with a factual piece of data, but then and it may be a thoughtful piece of data and then also a non-factual piece of data. Uh, all right. Um, I'm Tom. I'm a designer advocate here at Figma. Uh, I've been on the team for about a, a little over a year and a half now. Uh, excited to show you all plugins today. I've built some plugins myself and found them tremendously useful in my own workflow. So hats off to all those in the community that have made some really cool projects. Um, I guess a factual thing about myself, I... Um, one of my side hobbies is, uh, I guess I'm not supposed to announce that it's a factual thing because people are supposed to figure out which one is, <laughs> is ridiculous. So I'm not even going to go into what I was just going to say. Uh, let's just say that um, one of my favorite things to do is eat super healthy during quarantine. And uh, I'm also really into woodworking and cycling. 
So there you go. <laughs> uh, that was awesome. Okay. <laughs> uh, he's very good at woodworking and cycling. I'm guess I'm guessing you all. Uh, I actually don't know how good you are at cycling. Uh, so just to let you know, Tom's only going to be available for half the show. So if you, okay, apparently I'm calling it a show now. So if you uh, have any questions and you want to pick his beautiful mind, you might want to go ahead and do that in this first 30 minutes. We are going to go ahead and rapid fire jump into this so Tom can pack our minds with delicious plug-in facts. Uh, and I'm going to let, just hand this on over to Tom. Let's go. All right. Um... I'm in the Figma community. We're going to start with some cool plugins that uh, one of them was recently released. It's called uh, Save Selections by Aaron Wright. And this is sort of one of those things that there's a number of different ways to do something in Figma, but this comes in hand and I'll give you a really good use case for it. Um, but basically it saves your selection so that you can come back to them and you don't have to keep doing the hunt and peck point and click type thing. So I've already got this one installed. Uh, we're going to throw some links to the um, to the plugins in the chat if you want to follow along and give them a try yourself. But basically, here's a perfect example. I've got this uh, illustration here from Sarath that I've remixed. And the biggest thing that I've done is I've now sort of added a little bit of depth where these things are overlapping. And there may be a point in time where you want to group things so that they're easier to access. And so um, because I've got this depth, I might want to group these leaves together and I could select them all and I could do that. But the moment I group them, you'll see that now it puts them all on that same hierarchical layer, which I may not want because I've got depth. So let's just say I wanted to make selecting those things easier. That's where this plugin comes in handy. So if you haven't, um, if you might already know the shortcut, but command forward slash will allow you to search for a plugin that you've installed. And I'm just gonna search for save selections and it finds it and press enter and we launch our beautiful plugin. And so in this case, what I can now do is I can select all these leaves and then I can actually just hit save the selection. And then now I've got this thing loaded and ready to go. So when I'm working on this illustration, if I ever want to come back to those leaves, I just click on it. And now I can adjust all those leaves and sort of keep the depth of those layers. So this is really handy when you're doing illustration work. Um, you could also imagine some um, different types of using this. You want to select all the headlines or something in your document or and you just want to have them uh, really easy to go back to when you're sort of like iterating through. Um, this is like a really fun way of doing it. And yeah, I've got another sort of use case for it up here. Maybe you sort of like got to a point where um, you want to sort of style these individually. There's lots of different ways to use this. Um, this is sort of like a, a, an easy way that you can kind of use two plugins in tandem. I find myself doing this a lot where like one plugin kind of segues into the workflow of another one. So another one, you've probably already seen this one, but I'm going to plug it again because I feel like every time I tell somebody about it, it's handy for them. And that's this one called Similayer by Dave Williams. And so Similayer will allow you to select objects that all sort of share something. Um, I'm sure lots of you have already used this one, but just to kind of demo how it works, I'm going to launch Similayer. I'm going to select an object. And now it lets me select properties around that object. So in this case, what I actually want to do is select all of these circles, which are all 59 pixels by 59 pixels. And so what I could do is say, select all with the same, you know, width and height um, and even uh, fill color. And then I could say select layers and then it selects all those. Now uh, I could go in and I could configure that selection uh, each time, but being able to go back to uh, my selection thing here and hit save selection and just call this, you know, like white knobs. Uh, makes it a lot easier to come back to next time I need to modify those things. So hopefully that helps y'all in your your work workflow. Um, Tom, somebody in the chat. Thing, yeah, you're probably going right for what I'm going for. Go for it. Yeah. So somebody had said it sounds like grouping, and it kind of is the same as grouping, except going back down to this situation where you have depth and things that don't all live at the same depth or layer hierarchy or layer index in your design. Um, this is where it comes in handy because now. If I launch save selections again and I want to drag these leaves, um, I can select them all, but they don't all have to be at the same. If I was to group them, they're all going to be at the top bundled together. And now I've lost that depth. So this is sort of like, think of like the ability to group things. Um, but when uh, certain sort of Z index aspects of the group get in the way. So it's pretty handy. I've found myself wanting to do that in, in other design tools in the past when I've been doing more illustrative or icon work. And so this is, Super handy for me. 
at, at any point in the selection process, like if you change qualities about an object, uh, like let's say like for instance, I know that with Smart Animate, if you change the name of that layer in, in a subsequent frame, it kind of breaks that Smart Animation. So I'm wondering, is there anything with Save Selections that breaks it or is it like based off of a node ID? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, so I just renamed this Leave Hello. So it's, you know, and if I go, if I select Leaves again, it still selects the same thing. So there is a node ID behind the scene. So like if you decide to like move this around or like change its name, um, it's, going to still work. Now, obviously, this group has its own ID behind the scene. So I imagine that if I was to like ungroup this, so now I have these two shapes that are not grouped anymore and try to do it again, it's not going to capture that thing because that group no longer exists anymore. But there is a feature where you can um, you can select those things. Like I've just, like for example, uh, here, I'll select my leaves again. And then what I could do is go back and select those things. And you can actually refresh the selection. So now, um, it adds those two things back in. So if we added more leaves, we could add more to that thing. Um, oh, awesome. That's super cool. Down the road. Uh, all right. Um, the next one that I wanted to show um, is called Auto Arrow. Now, I think, again, this is a really popular one, but it's a question that we get asked a lot. And that is, you know, I, I'm you know, I want to put together like a, a flow diagram between a bunch of screens and I want to be able to draw arrows so that I can export a diagram um, outside of Figma. And um, this one's really nice. It has a couple of cool features that I think you'll find useful. So it's called Auto Arrow. Um, I feel like I remember the the name of the, the publisher for this one. Uh, it used to, The person I think has a, it's like what their actual name is, not Shopee Singapore. Um, I think that's the company that published it. Um, so I wish I could give a shout out to the developer name, but it's not coming to mind. But anyways, the way Auto Arrow works is you, we're gonna search for it in our plugin menu and we're going to go to our Auto Arrow and it looks like this. And so all you have to do is select two frames and then uh, click link and then it draws uh, this arrow. I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see it draws this nice arrow. And um, you can change the color of them as well. So like if you don't wanna draw these ones, you could just change the color here. And you can also change the, um, the direction if this one is sort of like feeding back into this thing. And so really quickly, just by selecting a bunch of frames, um, we could just, you know, create like a flow diagram that links all these things together. And... Um, okay, that's super fast. Yeah. Um, sometimes there are gonna be situations where it uh, doesn't work so well where like you're trying to go back through like a minefield of other frames so um there are some sort of limitations to that um but the other thing that is nice is there is an update function so let's just say you decided to sort of like you get crazy and now you're moving some things around the canvas you could just hit update and then it'll redraw those um those arrows back which is uh, a really nice thing right it that, seems to uh, maintain a connection so to speak to like each of the frames even though it can't live update the canvas, as soon as you hit update, it knows what it's connected to. Exactly. So um, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but I imagine it's keeping track of what arrows connecting which nodes and sort of storing the previous, you know, uh, X and Y coordinates of each. And then if they change it, it knows to redraw the arrow. So anyways, that one is pretty handy. There's some other plugins that are also worth checking out. Um, I think it's, it's called Autoflow. Why am I uh, drawing blanks on names? Uh, yeah, Autoflow, it was just one word um, by Yitong and David Zhao at Coinbase. And so it does a really similar thing. They both have like their, their pros and cons, but uh, again, definitely uh, check out both of these if you've ever had to do that again. Um, another one that I wanna go into is called Quantizer. Uh, and Vadim has been a pretty prolific plugin developer, and he's he wrote a post that I should probably try to dig up a URL um, about his sort of thought process in designing plugins. It's really interesting for those that want to go down that road. But this one that he built is used for uh, arranging things into grids. It has a couple of cool features. So definitely check out Quantizer. I'll show you how it works. Um, in this uh scenario i've actually already got some things set up on a grid but they don't have to be like you could have some things that are like off the grid and um this is great like if you have icons so let me just draw a white box around this so you can see a nice frame and we're gonna run our quantizer plugin 
And uh, it has a couple of cool options. The first one is we can define the number of columns and then we can define the space between the columns. So um, one thing to note is that it kind of seems a little bit arbitrary when you first run this plugin that it tells you that it wants to create 75 different columns. And that's because one of the things that people often want to do is put everything on the same line. And so in order to have that many columns, you need to know how many objects that you have selected. So to make that easier, um, Vadium has auto-populated this with a number of options. So you'll see what happens if I just leave that and I hit change, you'll see now it puts all these um, inside one big row. I'm just gonna undo that and run the plugin again. Uh, and, but in a more realistic use case, we might, we might wanna say like, hey, I wanna have 10 columns with 32 pixels between each. And then we can just hit uh, change and then it snaps those into a nice grid for us. So if you're just trying to do some uh, cleanup or some organization, um, this is a really good way to do it. And then another thing, this also comes in handy. I just find that again, there's a lot of these operations that I'm doing sort of back to back where sometimes I'll like arrange something or I imported my icons from sketch. Now I want to put them into a different arrangement. And then I'm like, oh, I don't need to use this forward slash naming structure in my components anymore. And then this is where like things like batch rename, if you haven't discovered this in Figma come in handy where I could say like, I don't want to tell everybody that these are 32 pixels because I don't want to organize them that like that way. Um, I could just type in 32 space space and um, it'll match that and I'm replacing it with nothing. Um, I could replace it with like a prefix like icon or something and then rename and then those are all renamed in a nice grid and it only took me a few seconds. So that one is uh, on my list of plugins that I use all the time. So shout out to Vadim for a great plugin. I had a quick question about that, Tom. Uh, if you could like back up before it was organized. Uh, yeah. So a couple undo steps here. Okay, in this scenario, um, without that plugin, what would be the way that we might organize those things? If we try to use like a Figma's tidy, what, what would that do? Yeah, so if you use tidy up, it will try to sort of like figure out what uh, like what arrangement that you want, but you don't have any way of like defining or controlling exactly how many rows that you want. So like in this case that I demonstrated at the beginning, I may want to have like all of these in one row, um, which I've done more often than I'm not, especially if I'm creating sprite sheets. Um, I want, I might want to have everything in a line then duplicate them and then color the second line and then group it all. And, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever done that before, but like I've done it a few times and, right. uh, having plugins to help with those repetitive processes is really handy. Um, but yeah, this just gives you a bit more control. It still does work really well with smart selections because like after the fact, like you could still go in here uh, and change the spacing between these properties in two different directions. And then um, if you're at a certain zoom level, you get these little handles. So if you decide that you want to like reorder these into different order, um, you can just drag the handle and, and move them around natively in Figma without a plugin. Yeah, it seems to play well with like the native ecosystem. That's why I asked the question because you ran the plugin and then I noticed that that tidy end and those gap margins and gap controls were already available for you. So you could then like yeah, fine and, tune it. And one thing to note too, is that like you may have situations where like maybe you're culling your icons and you're like, oh, we don't need these two icons. And now you have like these holes in here when you select it with smart selections. Um, all of these things are already aligned. So it's not gonna like fill in that gap. Whereas like you could, you could launch in Quantvisor and say like, okay, one, how many rows? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We got eight, eight columns we got, and then hit change. And oh then now yeah, it's that's gonna, great. It'll reorder them like that. So hopefully that helps. This one comes in handy a lot. All right, up next, custom frame presets. Uh, this one is by Gleb. Uh, definitely check out Gleb because Gleb has done a ton for the Figma community. And he also not only has a lot of plugins, he also has a lot of really interesting, some very wonky files that I love. Um, this one here, I know we're sort of talking about plugins, but like just go check out the user input in Figma plugin, um, which allows you, I'm sure you've checked this out too, Raji, but basically it allows, it's a prototype that allows you to sort of like type into like an input field. And um, <laughs> seeing how it's constructed is just, uh, it's bonkers. It's, 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 it's bonkers. And the reality for, uh, I think Gleb's just worth following on the Figma community and Twitter and all that just because to me, Gleb's like a Figma magician. Uh, <laughs> I remember throwing a challenge out uh, a couple of weeks ago about, hey, how could we create an animation of a full arc, like a loader, like a loading arc? 
Uh, and I was like, I did it in like four frames. And I thought I was a god. And then Gleb did it in like two frames, which uh, I'm still trying to dig the, the file apart and figure it out. So yeah, he's pretty damn good. Um, and I just realized I'm getting pulled away, but, but <laughs> I'm going just to do a scheduling issue today. But let me show you uh, frame presets. Sounds great, Tom. Custom frame presets. So basically, um, you can create your own collection of frames. And so um, you have to have the frame drawn. But once you've drawn that frame, you can add the preset and just call it shape. And then uh, you can hit enter and keep adding additional ones. And it may remembers the size. And then uh, this will get saved to your local storage. And I think there is um, a way that you can create a sharing key so that you can share your presets with other people on your team. But the nice thing is next time you um, you need one of these, you can just use them again. So, um, whoops, I clicked on Gleb's thing. You can support Gleb if you want as well. And yeah, so got our frame. Let me launch the plugin again. So there's our frame. Did it resize the frame? Is this working for you, Raji? Um, oh yeah, it's it's working for you. It's just the frame size that I put in is really small. Uh, <laughs> there it is there. So yeah, if you have a frame and click on it and hit shape, um, yeah, it will create that. And then of course, if you have additional ones, uh, you can edit or add new ones. So like, let's make this like. another size. We've had a lot of uh, requests for stuff like this, and um, it's not something that we've been able to integrate into the product in the past. But like, if you're like a company that's developing custom hardware with a really unique device size that you're using over and over again, you could define these, create a sharing key, share it with your team, and then everyone else can be using um, the same devices. So yeah. Um, I'll let you take it from here. And yeah, hopefully that give some people a few ideas. And I know you have a couple more in your sleeve that uh, I would love to watch, but yeah, take it away. All right, Tom, thanks thanks for jumping in. Thanks, thanks for so making much this for work. having me. Uh, we'll see you next time on Office Hours. Uh, head off to your meeting. Love you, dude. I'm gonna share something next and uh, it's gonna cool. be something you made. Oh, uh, nice, there you go. <laughs> yeah, get out of here. later. Get out of here, all right. All right, so uh, yeah, Tom's awesome. So Tom's also like, uh, the humblest dude, and uh, he wanted to share. We, I did. I wanted to share his status annotations plugin, and he was like, "I feel weird," because I was like, "Okay, Tom, I feel like you should share it because you know it best because you made it." And he's like, "I feel weird talking about my own plugin and then saying here's one for me." Uh, I already miss Tom too, absolutely. So uh, here's Tom's status annotation plugin. Now I know we talked about Gleb and how Gleb's a great community member. He's published lots of plugins. Uh, an equally great community member, if not, if not, well, an equally great community member uh, is Tom. Uh, and Tom's not gonna ever share that about himself. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about that status. Status, apparently I went Southern there for a second. Uh, status annotations plugin. All right, so let's just go back to this bird example here. Uh, with that plugin, if you go to the uh, your plugins in the community here, it's called Status Annotations. I linked you there. Uh, you can come in here and let's go ahead and run it. I'm going to select this frame, and I'm just going to use that quick command of Command Slash. I'm going to type in uh, Status Annotations. All right. So this is great. I remember when I was working at Dribble, uh, doing a lot of product design. And there were lots of like, we didn't know the current state of the design. And so often what we would do is we would, I don't know if any of y'all have done this, we would do this method. I'm gonna use uh, Shift X to uh, shift the fill to the stroke. And then we would do this. Uh, and we would put a big yellow rectangle around this thing. And this was like, these were the final ones. And then people kept looking at the other ones. So then we started doing this. We started putting a big gray rectangle, but we we're like, ah, we don't want to, you know, obfuscate it too much. So what we would do is put a uh, a layer blur, actually, sorry, a background blur effect on this one. And this was like, uh, don't touch. Like these are not supposed to be used. And then of course you could just turn it off or on to see it. Uh, there's lots of creative uses of Figma to be able to communicate, hey, this is ready. 
Well, welcome to Status Annotations. If my mouth would work today, that would be great. Um, so welcome to Status Annotations plugin. So we can go ahead and just select that frame and hit In Progress. And you can see right here on that frame that it says In Progress. So we've got a little color and everything on that. What if we need something to be reviewed? Okay, let's go ahead and review it. And then it says right here, this one's ready for review. Let's go ahead and uh, approve it or say this is ready for development or it's complete uh, or this one's archived. This one's no longer there. Tom, uh, design this plugin. He's got lots of little examples here. I believe that if you move the frame, uh, you can go ahead and do something called refresh. So this is using the plugin API here. The plugin, I believe it's called relaunch API. And so what a plugin relaunch API does is it plants some data on your document that's basically like, hey, Figma file, uh, I, I use this plugin. And so you can see here that I've also got uh, some other helpers here for Google Sheets Sync. So if I hit refresh, you can see that it moves this back to the frame. So Tom knows how to like tie it to the frame because you should be able to like rearrange your frames and then just hit this. I don't even need to select my frames at that point. That's a really helpful one. It's got quite a bit of downloads. I think people really loved it. Uh, I think people also just really love Tom. And that is, uh, that is not to be contested with. I love Tom too. Okay. Uh, I've heard so much about this plugin. Uh, I, I personally have recommended it. I've used it only a little bit. We're gonna talk about uh, Google Sheets Sync. So let's go ahead and go into the community here. Uh, Google Sheets, I think we can just type in. Uh, Google Sheets Sync, uh, a bunch of installs here. I actually just recommended this one to a friend the other day. Uh, so this is gonna be Google Sheets. I'm doing double duty here. Google Sheets Sync plugin. Um, normally I'm sort of MCing for Tom. Okay, so what this basically does is allows you to be able to take a lot of repetitive data. Uh, like these are all uh, repetitive forms. We've got these card views, but we have different data on each one. So we've got this Kings Canyon, Sequoia, blah, blah, blah. Well, what if all of a sudden this copy changed and you needed to be able to update that copy? Now, I wish that these were actually made in auto layout. They kind of seem like they are, but I'm not gonna even mess with it. Uh, but we wanna be able to just tie this data, the title, the location, maybe the number of reviews, uh, just to make this mock-up seem more real uh, and to simulate some data with it. There's lots of other like JSON plugins. There's a few other ones that'll actually like help you simulate uh, simulate some data and different data. But we're gonna go ahead and showcase this one here. So here's that spreadsheet right here. Um, if I could bring it in, I would. Uh, let's see here. Just kind of give you an idea. Yeah, let's get this thing in here so that we can actually see what's going on here. So this is basically what this data is. Now, let's, uh, let's try to understand how this thing works. So right here we have column names. So we have park name, location, description. And if we come over here, we can see where the data kind of overlaps here. And the way that you make the data bind to this thing is that you're just gonna put this little hashtag symbol in front of it. So let me see if I can uh, adjust my Figma just a bit so that we can, uh, we can really do this thing side by side so that y'all can see what's going on. All right. Yeah, I think this is in the stream now. I think it's working. All right, so uh, this is how the bindings work. You can notice park name here, location here. Now we're gonna go to an old state. I'm just gonna put in nothing here. Let's just pretend that this is just a random, like, like this about here is just a random bit of text. Uh, one thing that's kind of a cool trick, if I just uh, hit delete on this, it will actually take on the title. Uh, the name of this layer will be the content. Found that out the other day, love that. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this plugin, uh, but let's just blank out some of the data here. Let's just say we had just started making this thing. All right, so let's just go to resync Google Sheets data. Now I didn't select any frames, I didn't do anything like that. What I'm literally doing is, it's just knowing that because of these names of these columns up here, it syncs to this and you can see that it filled out all this information. Now let's go ahead and add our own here and see how that might work. And I believe the way that it works is it takes top to bottom here and it reads through these sequentially and then it will go ahead and just do the natural Figma order in the document, much like you would with a presentation. It just goes left to right, top to bottom, and that's how it knows to load the data in. 
So I want the number of reviews, and I've got that number right here, uh, reviews right here. And I want this to be synced up. So what I'm gonna do is put in the header name here, pound reviews, hashtag review. Nobody says pound anymore. I've showed my age. All right, so now I've got reviews in here. And I wanna go ahead and resync that data. So boom, let's resync it. Notice it said 2.5K. So I was thinking, how can we get a little bit more creative with something like this? And I thought, why don't we do this? Why don't we take this, put it next to this, and with auto layout, I'm gonna select both and hit Shift A for auto layout. Now I'm just gonna put a space here and put reviews. I don't need to, I don't need to replicate this data here. Sure I could, but I just kinda want the raw data there. And then on this one here, uh, it says reviews good, but this one here, we don't want that to sync there. Uh, that, could, that could be problematic here, so I'm gonna just delete that out. Let's go ahead and sync this up. I'm gonna go ahead and just do that. But notice how it changes with auto layout, that's great. So let's resync the data, let's see how it works. Awesome, okay. Now I think I already set this up here in that same way. So if I just put in here, let's put in two reviews and let's put in yeah, maybe like 5,000 reviews. All right, so we're gonna zoom out a little bit here and we're just gonna resync that data, boom. Awesome, so you can see how it's all working. Auto layout's working, it's awesome, it's working. I keep saying awesome, I keep saying working because it is cool. Okay, so on these image ones, I was actually trying to think like, would this even work? So yeah, it does. What I've done here with the images is that I put in the name image right here. And let's see what we've got here, image. And all I did is just put the URL in. Google Sheets Sync is smart enough to know that when you have a URL here and this is an image object, that it'll put that fill in there. Uh, I would love to mess around with it and be like, well, what if this was a color? Let's just give this a try. Will it just swap out a background color? Let's try red. Uh, we're, going, we're going rogue here, so who the heck knows if this will even work. All right, fingers crossed with me. Let's do this. It totally didn't even work, okay. Yeah, it did not work. It must detect that there's some kind of URL there. Uh, let's uh, let's blank that out. Let's see if it just actually blanks out the image. Let's run it again. Nope, it doesn't know to get rid of it. Okay, um, let's put in a new image. So we're just gonna put in Disneyland, just because I love Disneyland, and I would love to be able to see that image update just to prove it to you. Okay, we're just gonna copy the image address. We're gonna put it in here, boom. We're gonna say, what is this park name? It's Disneyland Park. All right, let's run it again. Oh, there it is. All right, it's all in. We're doing great. All right, so that's a super cool uh, way to bring in like dynamic content. Uh, love showing that to you. All right, let's move on to the next. Uh, also remember, if you have any questions along the way or you want me to demonstrate something, we're getting to sort of like the latter half of office hours and office hours is always about just hanging out in the office with us. It's a pretty candid experience. We want to share some cool stuff with you. So office hours, we always talk about a topic, but we always reserve some time at the end. If you just want to jump into something cool and nerdy, let's nerd out. All right. Let's see what else I can share with you today. Oh, okay. I bit off more than I could chew. Um, I've heard a lot about Figmotion. So if you are a, uh, let's just have this other page here. If you're familiar with Smart Animate, uh, let's just put a frame here and we got a little cool red circly, circly thing here. I'm just gonna duplicate this and then I'm gonna move this over here. Now let's just, let's do this. Let's just, let's do something very simple so that we can uh, keep our time, honor our time and get to lots of plugins. Okay, so essentially this is the before frame and this is the after frame. So in a prototype, I can actually link the two and then I can say on click, navigate to here and smart animate these values. And I think I've got somebody watching me. Oh, Josiah, you're the man. Um, he just noticed that it renamed my layer and if it renames your layer, smart animate does not work. So you got my back, love it. Okay, so let's just go ahead and test this out in present mode and let's see what this might look like. So on click, Smart Animate. That's great. I've seen a lot of amazing little Smart Animate experiments and I think, I think they're super cool. Uh, I think what is missing from Smart Animate is a lot of like timeline-based stuff 
as well as easing. So right now, if we go in here and we look at this navigation, we can see the easing. So there's ease, ease in, ease out, ease in and out, and linear. But if we ever wanna get more complex, and if you've ever been familiar with After Effects, uh, it's got a timeline or flash, it's got a timeline based, uh, attribute based animation. Uh, and it's, it's really, really powerful. It's a lot to wrap your head around, but it's very powerful. So, uh, the other thing that I think that people have struggled with is, and all those creators that have made amazing smart animate animations is this, let's say I'd like to capture this animation because this is perfect. And this is exactly what I want to put on a blog or on Instagram or something like that. What is it that I'm going to do to capture it? Well, in Figma natively, there's no way to just capture video of something. And so a lot of people end up having to do like some kind of screen sharing software. I do want to do a plug for Clean Shot X, uh, not even affiliated with Figma in any way, but honestly is an amazing, amazing piece of software. So if you're ever looking to sort of capture an area or record your screen, that could be a really good way to do it. But uh, there's no way to capture it easily. So a lot of people end up screen like screen sharing or screen shooting. All right, enter Figmotion. Now Figmotion is pretty wild. Like I'm pretty impressed with it, but I also don't even know anything about the uh, about the, the full capabilities of this. So I just kind of want to intro it. Uh, let's go ahead and select a frame. Uh, I could have just selected a frame, uh, but it's asking me now. So what I'm gonna do is select the frame first, use my quick command here, command slash, to get fig motion. And for all those who think that that forward slash is actually a backward slash, listen, I feel passionately about it. It's a forward slash, also known as slash. All right, so I set up this little animation here. We're gonna move this like this. I set up this little animation to kind of demonstrate. Um, I put in a keyframe here and here for the X and Y values of this ellipse. And if you actually run along the timeline, you can see what's happening here. Now, one thing that's very different about smart animating and prototypes is that it's all on the same frame, which if you're me, that's such a tremendous ease of burden because now I don't have a million different layers and a million different names. So let's kind of poke around with this. Uh, you can also see that there's a little bit of like a, like a wind up effect. So as it goes back, and forward, you can do this. What I love about this plugin is the fact that like you can scrub through slow and kind of see the nitty gritty things of what's happening in your animation. Whereas in present mode, it's just playing at full speed. Uh, you, There's not a, a very easy way to fine tune those things or to really get into the uh, more granular time here. But you can see that it winds up and then it comes back. So let's just hit play and see what it looks like. See how it like bounces back and then kind of does that sort of a thing. Um, that's not possible, uh, or at least with a lot of frames in Figma. So you can see here when I click the line, you can see what I did. So instead of a linear easing, and if we do that here, let's go back. You can see that this looks a lot like something we might produce in Smart Animate. See, just linear in a linear speed and fashion goes across the screen. But if I go to custom, I can then change. And if I go outside these bounds on the Bezier here, that's going to enable that kind of work, that behavior where it goes outside of the X and Y or X values in this case. So that's where it winds up and kind of backs up a little bit and then goes the other end. It's also got kind of a natural bounce behavior built in. All right. So this one I haven't got to try out yet, but I'd love to try it with you. Uh, all right. So let's see, how can we put a keyframe in here? There, I just click this little keyframe. Uh, any After Effects fans may realize that this is pretty similar. All right, and so the Y value, I can go there and then maybe right here, let's actually go halfway through and kind of create another value independently. And so I've moved the timeline to this 400 milliseconds and added that there. Now I want to change that Y value. So this seemed a little bit cryptic to me at first is that you would have to go in here and actually change this Y value like this and go up. Uh, I found out the way to take care of this. So let's not do this. Let's remove that. Let's add another point again. I'm going to just move this to the desired Y value at this point right here. So if I come back to here, 
if you hit brush, it's a very, very weird thing, but if you hit insert node value, it'll actually insert the Y value at that point. So there I go, let's preview this. And I think I may have broken my X value here. So let's move this over here and let's insert it there. Now let's come back and see. All right, we may have jacked up something. I didn't look at this plugin too much, but I apparently have done myself a non-service here. All right, well, we're gonna go ahead and leave it at that just because I don't know much more, but it is awesome. What I really wanted to show you though, once you get a hold of this tool, there's lots of uh, documentation on like how you can do these things. So we can figure out what happened with that node value, but we still have this animation. Now, this is the cool thing. Hold on, export. Export as CSS, export as JSON. So for those people, I had a lot of people on Twitter this week going like, hey, these are cool animations, but how do we get them out? Uh, especially more complex animations, you've got this thing here. But what about render? Oh wait, I can do like an MP4 at frame rates? Let's check this out. I think that this is the single most thing that got me really on this plugin. I have not yet figured out how uh, to do complex animations yet, as you can very well see, but this reminds me a lot of uh, Principle or After Effects. I love the timeline based thing. I'm gonna mess with it more. If I have more to share on it, I will absolutely do a live stream on that and we will learn together. All right, let's see, it's processing now. Okay, looks like we've got a view last render link here. And there we go. How rad is that? All right, let's move on. We've talked, we've talked enough, we've talked enough on that. All right, we're gonna do a couple of really small, quick ones here just to figure out uh, some really interesting uh, plugins. I like drawing in Figma, so I wanted to share a few of those. We've got another one called uh, Wave and Curve, uh, and I'll go ahead and just put that here, Wave and Curve. Okay, so let's just type this here. All right, Wave and Curve. Oh, I've got to spell it right. All right, it's right here. It's by Andruslav Kozlov. Uh, must be some kind of mathematical genius over here. Uh, because you'll see what I mean here. So let's just run it, wave and curve. Yeah, Bittergourd uh, pointed out that it's not quite After Effects, I agree. Uh, but for those that are authoring a lot of illustration work and for those that are authoring, like wanting to do animations in there, this is the best thing that I've seen to make animations that are close, uh, at least a little bit closer to that. All right, so the interesting thing about this plugin is that if you've ever wanted to create patterns or you've wanted to create some of these like zigzag lines, uh, in Illustrator it's pretty easy, but in Figma it's been a little bit harder, especially if you have things that have more sort of mathematically like sine wave type shapes. Uh, right, there we go. All right, so what this does is creates a vector line and puts it out there, but there's all kinds of really interesting values and you can just preview here what it'll output. So we can actually mess with these values and you can see that this wave and curve plugin is doing all sorts of funny things. Uh, this is great for patterning. Maybe you wanna create some like illustrative elements in your designs. I think this is a fun little plugin, not super, super powerful uh, in terms of like what it can do, but if it's for you, it's for you. I would just come in here, mess with these values. There are some random values that you can put in there to get some more expressive shapes here. Uh, and so we can just check out all sorts of things here, skews. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Uh, we can also put more waves in. You can also put in random values here. So this just creates a dice roll, kind of like, what can we do with this? And there's all kinds of funky little lines and shapes here. Let's say we really like this. Let's hit create, boom. Here we go, we've got all these uh, fun, silly lines. We can do something with them. If we look into this, you can see that it is a vector object and so that we can edit it natively. Uh, Roots Reggae says that Wave and Curve was very useful to him when he, uh, he or she was designing charts and dashboards. Cool. 
Uh, and Bittergourd actually added on top of this, added some context to uh, the Figmotion plugin and said, it is a very simple, there's not shape to shape tweening, there's not morphs between shapes. Thanks for pointing that up. So think of it more for like a simple animation tool. All right, let's move on to the next plugin. Uh, the next one I wanna share with you was uh, Pattern Hero. All right, so here's the plugin, Pattern Hero. All right, let's go ahead and go check it out. Wanna make sure we get Q&A time in here as well. Uh, we can do a little bit of shop talk. Uh, but here's Pattern Hero by Nitin Gupta. Uh, this one you can do exactly what you see here. Create patterns, grids, textures with ease. So I'm just going to run it. We're just going to do a quick showcase, much like we did with that Wave and Curve plugin. Right? All right, so what we're going to do, let's just start with this and see what we can do with this here. So we're going to select that object. Uh, once again, we can run it with uh, command slash. And let's just see what it does right out the box. All right, there we go. So we've got a pattern. So I think the best way that we can learn is just to mess around with this one. Um, I've been messing around with it a little bit. And I think there's some pretty cool things you can do with it. Uh, so let's say padding two, let's create the pattern. Oh, unfortunately what I did is I actually, uh, <laughs> I did all kinds of stuff. I had that, uh, I had the previous pattern selected and it got wild. Uh, let's say, um, let's go a little simpler here and let's see how this works. Create the pattern, cool. And once again, we've got this so we can space those apart, move them negatively if we'd like to. Uh, there's also this idea of shuffling nodes. So let's see if we can create another shape here with a different color and see how that might work with this. All right, let's do that. Beautiful colors, beautiful. Uh, let's shuffle the nodes, uh, group the nodes. All right, let's give that a try. All right, awesome. So you can imagine what this might do for you uh, as you get multiple colors and things like that in, uh, multiple design elements, you can start creating patterns with this. Uh, it would be pretty great if we could do like a varying opacity or almost like a random notion to this. Let's see if there can be a random notion to this. Let's go ahead and turn on shuffle notes and see what that does for us. Oh, yeah, so that's a bit of a random element. So I'd imagine just as you try more and more and just kind of experiment with this, you can get some really interesting effects out of this by shuffling nodes. Uh, you could also potentially have like some that are partially transparent. So let's just go back real quick. Oh, we must have had group on too. All right, so let's go here. Let's take this, let's take this here, and let's just do a little bit of, like perhaps you could put like on some kind of like multiply or soft light or overlay mode. So let's put this here. Let's try overlay. I don't even know what we're doing with that. Let's try multiply actually. I think that might do us a little bit better. Yeah, that's good, I like that. Okay, let's take that and let's just create a pattern out of that. And then, if we ungroup it, I don't really like the group selection thing. I might actually do this and just see how all these objects start to play with each other. So anyways, something uh, something to go ahead and uh, something to think about, something to have some fun with. Uh, I have not, Owls says, have you showcased Looper already? Looper's really great and I'll go ahead and jump in and do that. Um, actually, I think it's already installed. Let's go ahead and give it a try. Looper, all right. Looper's fun. Um, one of the biggest examples I've seen with this would be something like this. Um, let's say office hours, the name of this little live stream. I'm gonna go to scale mode here, just so I can scale that text up. Let's, uh, let's choose something super duper fun, which is not at that. Woohoo! Uh, why not that? Let's go with that one. All right. Uh, one thing that's cool about this, I just learned this one the other day, if I double click this frame, uh, the way that you would normally get this to not wrap like that, because it's in um, it's in this sort of fixed size, you would just do something like this, just go to auto width, but you can also come to the edge of the frame, double click on it, and it does that for you, and I love that so much. Okay, let's just say, all right, this is going to loop the text, let's do eight iterations, let's just see what it does on out of the box. All right, so it just moves it in a linear fashion down this way. All right, let's 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 back that up real quick. And let's say, I wanna do some rotation with this. Can I rotate it? 
I would love to rotate it. So let's just go start color. Um, unfortunately, these aren't actually real color picker, color pickers. So we'd have to go, let's go, uh, let's just go colors we know that are easy. Uh, so we'll go red to that. Uh, we could also put in a, a stroke and opacity. Let's just fade that out. So this will sort of tween in between these. Uh, let's go scale. All right. And oh, here we go. This is it. This is the rotation. Let's rotate this sucker. All right, let's go. Let's see what this does. This better be beautiful. Um, Looper half failed on me. Well, this is what happens when I run. What did I do? <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, okay. I blame Owls for that because uh, you, had, you had me do something that I wasn't prepped to do on stream. I, I would love for it to work, though. It did work. Oh, I'm sad. It's just what died. It's busted. All right, we're going to move on. Um, it is cool. I've seen some pretty cool effects, essentially with rotating text and uh, stroke getting larger and larger and larger, and then opacity shifts. You can set blend modes on this stuff. It's really cool uh, to create like text effects, but it's not just text. You can do all kinds of stuff, uh, shapes, objects, who knows? All right, let's go ahead and uh, this is one uh, that's just a little bit more practical, but I think that uh, it could really help with dev handoff. All right. Let's go back here. Let's go to tiny image. So we're gonna share tiny image. Is it all one word? Probably one word. Tiny image compressor, there it is. Install that. Okay, so tiny image. Uh, if you haven't noticed, I'm sure that you have, but if you haven't noticed, uh, anytime that you'll export an image out of Figma, it's not really compressed. Uh, it's it's pretty large in file size. It's never something that you would want to put on a prod site. Uh, now, a lot of times uh, for certain dev processes, uh, those those images at full uh, at full res and and large, that's fine. It doesn't really matter because there are processes uh, that developers have done to go ahead and crunch those images and make them the right size and all of that. Uh, that's great. But sometimes, let's say you're in a smaller team or smaller studio, or you'd like to just go ahead as an independent designer, just export your images out at something that maybe you can upload to a blog software, or maybe you're just like creating your own raw HTML site. Uh, let's go ahead and experiment with this. Now, if we go here, let's just go ahead and type in tiny image. All right, here we go. I love that little intro too. All right, so here we go. Oh, it's no selected visible layers. Why did it not have a selected layer? This can't be the second time I whiff. Sorry, I'm not gonna allow it. This is all frames. Oh, oh, got it, okay, got it. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this in a frame. So I'm gonna go ahead and go, I think it's Command Shift G. Command Option G, and that'll frame my selection. We're gonna try this one more time. Cross our fingers. Let's see, I think it needs a frame to run on. A lot of plugins need frames to run on, which it is just not working. Uh, well, anyways, we're gonna go ahead and try another one. This was working for me, and maybe my Figma's actually just kinda crashing. Um, let's go uh, Image Compressor. I've worked with a few of them. Yeah, anyways. Uh, what this should look like and what this should do is be able to uh, change, like export things at more compressed rates. It's a great plugin. I do think that I'm kind of having a bit of an issue here. Uh, let me see here. I do think that maybe Figma has died on me. Yeah, Rosemary just said that Tiny's working today. Um, and he said, define an image as an export. So let's just try that. Oh, there we go. There we go. All right. So anyways, we can create a GIF out of this, which is really cool. Um, I have not ex I have not messed around with this much. So I'm wondering what kind of GIF we're looking at here. So we've got frames. Okay. 
All right, this is what I wanted to showcase. This one's more of an exploratory one for me. I haven't really got to mess with it very much, but I love the fact that now with this, I can actually, uh, I can actually output an animated GIF, which has been something that a lot of people uh, have wanted to do and a lot of requests in Figma. So now that it's working, Now that it's working, we'll go ahead and mess with this a little bit. So time per frame. I wonder if we can do a few frames and just see, like what if we took this and this, and I just wanted to take this one, I'm gonna copy the fill out of this, paste the fill there. I'm gonna create a three frame GIF with Disneyland, the delightful place that is currently closed down. And I'm gonna take all three of these. Uh, all right, let's go ahead. Ah, there we go, plug in launch API. Let's see what tiny image does. All right, let's create the GIF. Oh baby, this is great. I love this, this is great. Oh, this is fantastic. This is so great. Okay, there's lots to explore in here. Uh, you can even, they even have all the presets for the dithering types for GIF, which is great. We can create a GIF from here, but also we can go ahead and change potentially uh, our settings for quality, which is way cool. Um, looks like they can also do WebP, which is amazing. I actually didn't even know this about this, so we're learning together. Uh, this is great. Uh, I am now gonna be recommending this plugin to everyone. Uh, there's also some sort of like prefixes here, special values in your file name that will automatically set it up for maybe a name. Oh, cool. You can inject names into it by doing this sort of variable naming in there. Oh, great. You can actually inject the width into this. Let's just do that. I'm just nerding out hard. Uh, let's go ahead and say like, let's say we were going to say like uh, Yosemite. And then we were going to say something like this. We want it to have a width. And then we want it to have a height in there. All right, let's see if this works. All right, let's get back in here. Tiny image meme. All right, so now we're gonna say you can use these in your file names. I'm hoping layer name is, is what we wanna do. Let's compress it and let's see what it names it to be. Nope, didn't do it right. Maybe I didn't read it right. Let's see, so that seems right. You can mix any of these. Now, what did I do here? Maybe the dash naming before it messed up. You can mix any of these special values. Example output, Yosemite, boom, boom, boom. Oh, oh, so maybe I'm doing it actually in here. Let's try that. I'm new here too. Let's give it a try. Let's see if it puts those numbers in there. Yes, awesome. Okay, it works that way. Awesome. All right, well, that's been Tiny Image. I wanna keep, this usually lasts about an hour, but I'd like to just have Q&A at the end. So let's go ahead, I can share more plugins. I've got plenty more to share, but I would love to ask you all uh, what you're thinking. If there's any questions that you have about anything we've presented or any questions really about anything about Figma, I'm here to answer them. So hit me up. All right, since we don't have any, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about that uh, Faker. I think the plugin is called Faker. Uh, I actually haven't used this as well. Tom's used it quite a bit. Tom was gonna present on this, but Tom had to go out a little bit. So here's Faker. Um, this is by Corey Etzcorn. I'm gonna go ahead and copy that link and give it to you all. Ah, okay. We've got a question, so I'll go ahead and hit the question since I asked. Uh, Gabby says, hey Raji, the content manager is in my office who only have viewing uh, viewing rights to the file would be able to change, would like to be able to change a copy in Figma files. Is there a plugin which is good for that? Uh, Gabby, at the beginning of, um, at the beginning of our 
plugin showcase, we actually talked quite a bit about Google Sheets Sync. Uh, and so Google Sheets Sync could allow them to not have edit permissions in there. Granted, most copywriters, especially that I've worked with, uh, often wanna work with like micro copy and button titles and all sorts of things and really see the design and work with it in the design. Uh, oftentimes they might wanna get edit permissions just for that. Uh, but yes, Gabby, you're right. An editor would need to refresh. Uh, there are lots of content plugins that I didn't prepare, but uh, if you go out to the community and look for that, um, I believe Content Reel is one of those here. Uh, just go out here, type in content, and we can see, or at least you can see, uh, what ones could be useful. Now, if they are plugins, that's absolutely true. They're gonna need an editor to come in and refresh those things, but one quick solution to that would just allow that editor to have edit permissions and edit rights, but if you're not in a place where you can do that, uh, then have an editor refresh that content via some of those plugins. All right, so let's uh, let's take this. Let's um, let's open up Faker. Uh, Tom showed me a little bit about it. Uh, the idea is just like maybe you don't have content. Maybe you don't have content in a Google spreadsheet or anything like that. And really, what you want to do is just like throw a bunch of dummy data in there. Uh, Faker is cool because it has a lot of like random values for things that you would use often. Uh, so, for instance, I'm building. Who knows what I'm building? I'm building a uh, an auto layout row. And it's like this, I have a name. Um, let's see what else there's in here. Uh, let's say we have an address in there. So it's like my street address. I see we're working with ITC Bengua standard and it's looking real, real cool. Um, second street address, we'll just do that, who knows. I think you could also use this in conjunction with Similayer. Uh, we'll check that out in just a second. Uh, let's see if there's there's all sorts of things that we can, uh, look at all this stuff. Country, state, all sorts of things that you could uh, break out here. Wow, very cool. You can just search through this too. All right, let's just give it a try and it's like sort of simplest incarnation. I'm just gonna hit first name. Uh, and you can see here that I can hit it. All right, now let's just give another situation. Let's say, uh, <laughs> I'm still, I'm still kind of freaking out because we're doing it with this thing here. All right, let's say we've got this here. I auto layouted this thing. Uh, I'm gonna make it a component uh, aptly named Frame 11, and I'm just gonna repeat components. This is more a common scenario. I'll wrap that in an auto layout frame. I just kind of want to see how this all works. Uh, okay. So if I come here and I select each one of these, this is why I said this could often work out best with Similar. Let's just run that first name. And it does do exactly what I thought it would do. Uh, it, it does this random per, it does this thing where it does a random, uh, a random name per layer. So now let's go to the street address here and let's just see if we've got like a street address. Maybe we'll just type it in here. A whole street address, great. Ah, that's great, that's great. Now I wish that you could find some way of just like doing it here and then it would go all down here. I do not like where I have to keep selecting all these, but remember those other plugins that we shared, save selections could really be a good thing for this and you could just select these all as street addresses or we could have some kind of like uh, similar, uh, similar selection here where you actually uh, take this and put in street address and then use Similayer to look up all the street addresses. All right, so let's go, we've got a few questions coming in uh, and looks like the community has some things they'd like to share. Uh, I was asked, is there gonna be improvements for the present part of Figma? I wish you were able to center align the whole prototype. Uh, I am curious about, um, so I know they're always working on things. Figma's ridiculously amazing. Uh, at the speed at which they're processing things. We're always listening to y'all too. Uh, as a designer advocate at Figma, my job is to listen to you and then to bring that feedback uh, from the designers to the team. So I would love if you could explain uh, what you mean about presenting in center. So right now um, I'm running this and it's appearing to me to be centered in that. And so if I could get a little bit more context around your question, how I'm misunderstanding there, then I can help out and uh, if it doesn't work, then we can give that feedback to the team. Uh, all right. Uh, 
Joao says there's a cool new plugin called Scale. Yes, just noticed that that came out today. It's called Scale. It resizes all the child elements and effects. It looks super duper cool. Uh, I think that's uh, really great. I just saw it. I have not demoed it, but uh, what I've uh, what I've heard as feedback from a lot of designers is if you want to scale this object here, uh, you have to press K or go into the scale mode here, and then you have to scale everything down. Now, the problem with this becomes, and I've, I've dealt with this problem myself, is what if I want this thing to be 320 pixels wide? Like, notice I'm working with fractions of a pixel here, which is really annoying. So I've had to go in here. This is how I've sort of worked around this here. I come and I create a little frame, uh, and then I do 320 pixels. I kind of align this here. Then I come back to this frame, press K, and then kind of snap here. And it should do like a little bit of a snap to that 320. Uh, and that's the way I've worked around it. It's still totally annoying. And scale allows you to just add in your own values and it should just go boom, everything is scaled as opposed to the move tool. If you try to go 320, you'll see what's happening here. So, all right. Uh, H asks, what is this search plugin? It's not a search plugin. It's actually just command forward slash here brings you into this menu. I have become addicted to this thing because it not only searches through all the commands within Figma here, including uh, shortcuts and things like that. Like if you just wanted to know if there's a shortcut for something, you could see like, is there a resize? Uh, what? That must have been a plugin. <laughs> golden, golden uh, ratio. But uh, is there like a rename command? Oh, yes, there is. Boom. Rename duplicated layers. So there's all kinds of amazing stuff within this search menu. Uh, it's kind of like Spotlight in OSX. But the other thing you can do is just type in plugin stuff. So if you want to type in, uh, oh gosh, let's type in Tom status annotations. Here that is, boom, I can go ahead and run those commands here and there's status annotations. I don't have to navigate my completely unwieldy plugin menu. All right. Uh, and Ratsons actually answered my question. Thank you so much, Ratsons. All right, so Hanel asked, is there any plugin that I can help with padding and measurement in pixel position about any that shows both side both sides measurements is the same. Uh, off, off the cuff, um, I think one thing that you might look at, and I'll just dump this in the chat. I didn't get any chance to uh, showcase this, but uh, so Hanol, you might check out the plugin Redlines that allows you, it's more of like a dev handoff tool, but it allows you to see measurement and space between things. Uh, also, the other thing that you might do is say you want to know the padding between this and this and you you don't want to come I used to do this all the time as a designer a youngster I would come in here and I'd be like okay okay I think that's 24 and I put these little like things to measure uh, red lines can help with that but one other thing you can do too is by holding option and selecting an object you can actually uh, go and uh, hover over the objects around it and you can see spacing. So uh, with that option key, I now know that like, oh, this thing is two pixels away from that. This thing is, looks like 20, 12 pixels away. So this uh, state here is 12 pixels away from the image below it. Now, if I just click this here, this title, I hold option and I move away from it. I can now see that this is 40 pixels from the top. It's 24 pixels from uh, the side. And that's just built in and that's native to Figma. So that's not red lines. That's just the native thing. And that may help you along your way. I hope it does. Uh, Alice says, I have a 19 pixel, 19, 19, 20 pixel width web prototype. And when it's someone with a smaller screen that opens it, it's not center aligned. Oh, no problem. I hope I have a solution for you here. Let's make a big, huge frame. Oh, this one's big. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and go to prototype mode. Uh, what I'd like to do is find the playhead, first of all. There might actually be a, a great way to do that, but I'm gonna just do this instead. I am going to go in here, get rid of this. Great. All right, so this one's a big boy. Now I'm on a huge screen, uh, so let's use K 
to scale this thing to make it ginormous. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a hefty one. Uh, this has happened a lot for me as well, Sahano, uh, where I'm designing on an iMac, or maybe I'm actually designing. It doesn't really matter what you're designing on. Maybe I'm designing for very, very large screens. Maybe I'm doing a gaming UI, and that gaming UI is intended for like dual screen kind of coverage. And so uh, it really needs to be uh, that big. It needs to be pixel perfect. Uh -huh. Uh, Ratson says, can you introduce them to the Nudging by 8 Pixels? I'll get to that. Absolutely. Uh, Woohoo! Oh, my plugins was already open. It was presenting on that page. All right, let's, okay. Here's a perfect example of that. Like now I'm in my prototype, like whoever would want to do this. So what you'll want to do here is just go up to the 100% menu here and just scale up or down to fill. And you'll see that this uh, occupies the most space that it can in the prototype, but still allows you to be able to view it here. So that's incredibly helpful. I use it all the time. You can also scale it to width. So now we've got a little bit of scrolling, I believe here, because it's side to side. Uh, you can scale down to fit. Um, you can look at these different modes. I also know that Figma's working on some of those different modes too. So uh, you can go back to full size. That might help you be able to present your prototype. I really hope it does. Let me know if it does. Uh, Ratsons asks, uh, can you introduce them to nudging by eight pixels? Yeah, I would love to. Let's do that. All right, so uh, I, a friend of mine a long time ago, maybe 10 years ago, introduced me to the eight pixel grid. Uh, the reason that oftentimes you'll wanna use an eight pixel grid uh, is say you're designing icons or something like that. Uh, and you're on an eight pixel grid. Uh, eight is perfectly, and you can say 16, any multiple of two really. So two, four, six, eight. Uh, anytime you scale something down to a half size, uh, it's perfectly on the pixel grid. So you're not getting any half pixels. Uh, that's why I love working with an eight pixel grid, uh, especially for padding and amounts like that. Uh, when I first started web development, I started with like 10 pixel stuff. like. 10 or 20 pixels, but the problem is as you scale those down, once you divide 10 by two, let's say you need a, a scaling down padding system. So on the modal dialog, it's 20 pixels. On a button, it's 10 pixels. On even like on a mini button, it's five pixels. Well, if you divide that by two enough in the system, now you're sitting at like 2.5 pixels. So I love the eight pixel grid because it's a, uh, it's uh, never on a decimal value. So let's just say, I think we might even be able to use this really great, uh, this really great uh, menu here. Let's just put a nudge, there you go. You can just type in nudge amount here. Normally in Figma, a small nudge is one, a big nudge is 10. Now say you're working on an eight pixel grid and I wanna take this little square and I wanna move it like this. Uh, depending on the grid that you're used to, that you like, maybe it's a 16 pixel, depending on what you're working on, now you're not here. So then you have to like sort of drag it back up into the right position. Uh, and every designer that I've known uses nudging. So you can customize your nudge amount by going here and putting in eight. You can also make the small nudge too, if you never wanna just nudge it by one pixel. Once again, let's do this. And now to nudge, I'm gonna just do one pixel there, just with my directional keys, but if I hold shift, now I'm perfectly on eights, and this makes my heart sing. Uh, thank you everyone so much for coming to my office hours. Thank you uh, to Tom for, uh, for being a champ uh, and, and squeezing in some plugins that were his favorite. Uh, thank you everyone for coming and checking out all these things. I hope I answered most of your questions. I hope that they helped. Uh, yeah, Tom's the champ, absolutely. Uh, we love him. Uh, we never want to lose him, ever. He's the best. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my next live stream is actually going to be next Monday, uh, and that's on figma.com slash events. You can see all of them. We're, uh, let me just put that link here. So you can go ahead and add those events to your calendar so you can get a reminder. Uh, you can also use subscribe features on YouTube or Twitch if you'd like to do that. That's fine. Uh, but next week, we're gonna be starting a brand new build it in Figma, and we're gonna be building a brand new app and just sort of discovering and, and building everything from the ground up. We literally start and build it, build it in Figma with a blank canvas. So with nothing but dreams in our hearts and heads. Uh, 
Thank you everyone for coming. You've been the best. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks for the great questions. Uh, until next time, uh, office hours are closed. Thanks so much.